I'm not huge on reading fiction, since most of what I read is non-fiction, but I know the Harry Potter books pretty well. As an anarchist, I'm struck by how boring and middle-of-the-road the politics of Harry Potter are. Various articles have been written comparing situations and characters in Harry Potter to real life, and while some of J.K. Rowling's writing is allegorical, even the allegory is boring. I'm not really going into J.K. Rowling's own views here, because there are lots of videos on that already, for example, on Jesse Gender's channel, which you can find in the description if you don't already know about it, but she's much bigger than me, so I'm, I'm sure you already know. Rowling has some pretty vile politics when it comes to trans people, but beyond that, I don't know much about her as a person, and I'm not very interested. I'm only interested in interpreting the book. I know a lot of people hate Harry Potter because of J.K. Rowling, and some because of the book's shortcomings, and some because they're sick of hearing about it all. But I'm guessing you're not in that last category, or you wouldn't be here. Not all the politics of Harry Potter are bad, they're just not bold. They don't rock any boats. Even the positive lessons are infused with boring politics. Let's start with them. We learn from the Harry Potter books not to buy into the prejudices floating around. There is bigotry against wizards born of muggle parents, and we learn that prejudice is pretty much the basis for wizard Nazism. The Death Eaters are an obvious allusion to the Nazis, and of course they are, because Anglo-American culture pretty much revolves around Nazis and Hitler and World War II. So th th there's, there's bigotry also against werewolves, uh, but it turns out not all werewolves are bad. So basically, don't be a Nazi, and don't be afraid of everyone in that group that's different from yours. So, like every cartoon I grew up watching. We learn that the government and the press lie when it's in their interest to do so, as the Ministry of Magic lies and pressures the newspaper The Daily Prophet not to print things about Voldemort coming back, and the fact that the reporter Rita Skeeter just makes stuff up. But again, don't we already know that? Shouldn't we be learning that from the age of five? Do no teachers or parents ever convey that to their kids? Most people don't have really developed senses of skepticism for politics, but I don't know anyone who unquestioningly believes everything they hear. Well, maybe the people who read The Gray Zone. Of course, the Ministry doesn't only lie, but does a lot of the things that the Bush and Blair governments were doing after 9-11, when the books were being written. One favorable review begins, What would you think of a government that engaged in this list of tyrannical activities? Tortured children for lying? designed its prisons specifically to suck all life and hope out of the inmates, placed citizens in, a pr in that prison without a hearing, ordered the death penalty without a trial, allowed the powerful, rich, or famous to control policy, selectively prosecuted crimes, the powerful go unpunished and the unpopular face trumped up charges, conducted criminal trials without defense counsel, used truth serum to force confessions, maintained constant surveillance over all citizens, offered no elections and no democratic lawmaking process, and controlled the press. And it's good that the books criticize these activities. But Who's in favor of those things, really, at least publicly, other than governments and conservatives? Hey, it's better that we read books opposed to torture and indefinite detention than books that are in favor. But as I'll explain soon, a critique of the most egregious government practices isn't enough. 
Satire is one of the main purposes of science fiction and fantasy. Criticizing extreme violence is the least it can do. The books encourage skepticism of government and the press, but there's no robust critique, no analysis of how systems make it all happen. It's criticism of the same things everyone I knew was criticizing already. The Harry Potter series has received a lot of criticism for the lack of people of color and LGBTQ people, um, along with sexism and gender roles, fat shaming, racial stereotypes, normalized abuse, and Voldemort being sneakily coded transgender. For every positive message, there's another we should not be learning. I could probably spend some time analyzing Hogwarts and the education system, but I touch on it in the blog post that I write that I will get to in a second. Plus, I have a whole playlist on what's wrong with education in the real world and how to solve it, and I link to all this in the description. And most of it applies to Hogwarts. I would add, there's way too much competition at Hogwarts. It's in the nature of dividing them into houses. Your friends are from the same house, rather than from all houses. The students have to get over their disinclination to talk to people from other houses, but only when there's a mortal threat. There's even one house apparently dedicated to evil. So they're everyone's enemies, regardless of what they're like individually. In fact, in the second book, Lee Jordan suggests kicking the whole of Slytherin out of Hogwarts, and he doesn't get much pushback. The books don't acknowledge that people only become cruel or whatever through their environment, because they learn to dominate or trick people or use violence. The books imply people are born good and bad, and they'll stay that way. So we need to separate them on that basis. Kids should not be dividing into castes to compete with one another. It's bad for them psychologically. They should be learning to cooperate, work together, regardless of background, to solve their problems. Instead, Hogwarts contains most of the same failings as our schools do. Kids shut up and sit at desks and work alone. They're separated by age rather than ability. Competition is rewarded and collaboration is not. They're disciplined and punished, including being punished collectively as whole houses lose points for the actions of one or more members. They have testing and homework and everything else that makes school unnecessarily difficult and boring. Here's another problem I have. House elves are happy slaves. There is one and only one slave in all the books who wants emancipation. All the others want to be slaves. Is Rowling trying to say most slaves are happy with their lot? Because there's a big difference between the slave that just doesn't quite get how bad things are for them and the slave that embraces and celebrates their slavery. Yeah, some slaves are so ground down they think peaceful slavery is better than chaotic freedom, but in Harry Potter that's almost all of them. Only the one with the cruelest master wants freedom, and he only wants the freedom to change masters. We have real slaves in the world today, more than ever before in history, in fact. In the books, in response to realizing house elves are enslaved, Hermione sets up an organization to campaign for their rights. But they don't want it. How could this possibly reflect real life? If Rowling had any leftist tendencies at all, I might think house elves were a metaphor for wage laborers, and Hermione's efforts to free them were efforts to abolish the wage labor system. But I see no evidence of that. Hermione doesn't even really listen to the people she's campaigning for. She doesn't care that they don't want her help. She wants to give them wages, holidays, and pensions, which they wouldn't know what to do with. To her, wages, holidays, and pensions are liberation. 
To the rest of us, they indicate remaining trapped in wage labor. You're not free if you're forced to get a job. You're not free if you're forced to follow someone else's orders all day. For humans, liberation would include organizing our own work for ourselves, deciding together as equals. For house elves, freedom is a dirty word. You need to educate people so they can liberate themselves. And if they're repulsed by the idea, stop trying to help them and talk to someone else. There's one other basically positive thing I'll give these books, and that's the resistance we see, mainly in Book 5, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Like all the positives in this video, it doesn't go very far. I won't go into detail here because uh, I wrote about it on my blog before I started this channel, so you can find a link in the description. Suffice it to say, the students display a variety of tactics to rid themselves of a tyrant. Inasmuch as the point of this book is solidarity and direct action and to speak out and rise up collectively against tyrants, I like it. I like that message. They just could have gone further. Instead of restoring the status quo, they could have found ways to prevent another umbrage from ever coming back. I've made a few videos on this channel about stateless governance. In other words, ways for people to govern themselves, as opposed to being governed by someone else. So if you don't know much about that, check them out. There are a few qualities I think the population needs to embody to preserve their freedom to govern themselves. They need a sense of solidarity. So considering each other equals, no bigotry, sticking up for each other, refusing to accept oppression, because they feel compassion, and because they know they're never truly free while others are oppressed. Along with solidarity and self-governance, they need self-defense. Of course, the more people are involved, the easier this is to achieve, but even in a small group you can train and practice, like the DA, and try to coordinate with similar groups. But what's the goal of such training? Liberation. Full emancipation from all systems of hierarchy, not just from the most evil people. Let's talk about the Ministry of Magic. A lot has been written about the Ministry of Magic as representing modern government. It's portrayed as bureaucratic, inept, corrupt, all the complaints people make about the modern state. It pursues its allegorical war on terror with the same disregard for innocent casualties as the Bush and Blair governments did theirs, locking people up without trial because people expect a government tasked with doing everything to be seen to do something. But in criticizing only certain policies or practices as merely excessive is to miss the point of what government is. The point of government is not, and has never been, to serve the people as a democracy. Its purpose is to concentrate power in the hands of the people at the top and their friends with money. That's why the word corruption is misleading. It implies government is not supposed to concentrate power and create classes and lock people up for nothing and that there was once a time when things were different. After 9-11, after decades of propaganda priming Americans to hate foreigners and fear terrorism, governments had to be seen to do something. And they knew the more pointless violence they engaged in, the more voters they would satisfy until the next election. But most of the Ministry of Magic's response to the return of Voldemort is not analogous to the War on Terror. Voldemort's return is a real danger. Terrorism is barely a danger to anyone. Your chances of getting killed by a terrorist are so low, and have been every year you've been alive, that you're more likely to die by almost any other cause of death you can think of. But being such a flashy way of killing people, terrorism has the potential to scare everyone. 
the Bush and Blair teams hyped up the so-called threat of terrorism at every turn. The media constantly churned out stories about terrorism or terrorists or just how they could get you if they wanted to. They made sure people were on their toes for long enough to manufacture consent for their war on Iraq. And it wasn't just those governments, as Russia, China, and Israel, among others, uh, used 9-11 as excuses for their own escalations against the people they had also labeled terrorists. The Ministry of Magic doesn't really do any of those things. Instead, it downplays the danger. So the ministry's response to Voldemort's return is not anal an analogy to 9-11, but like, like some people say. But, you know, another uh, World War II comparison. And I don't have to explain that part to you, because everybody already knows everything about World War II. After Voldemort dies, like when Hitler died, nothing fundamentally changes. The message is, stop the Hitlers of the world, and that's it. In case this unimaginative culture hasn't spent 70 years hammering that lesson home yet, and then go back to brunch. By official mandate, the Ministry of Magic dominates magical creatures and denies them the means to defend themselves, like wands, when human hegemony is the source of their anger. Their history is full of goblin rebellion which might be reminiscent of separatist movements, were never treated to reasons why they should be considered subordinate to humans. But again, nothing changes at the end, so apparently that's the way things should be. It's one of those things the book treats ambiguously. It's not clear how we're supposed to feel about it. Most ministry departments have no value, like magical games and sports whose mandate could be done by anyone as a hobby. The Department for International Cooperation presumably does the same as it does in modern government, makes real cross-border cooperation impossible by limiting people's movement and limiting trade that doesn't go through official channels. I think this department raises the question of why there are countries at all in the magic world. I mean, if you know the history of countries in our world, in the real world, you know that they were created by conquest, killing and subjugating locals and extracting rent from them. Well, when did that ever happen in the wizarding world? Did they just shrug and go along with the state building in the muggle world for thousands of years and now they're just as divided and nationalistic as everyone else? And we're not going to address that? All right. Like all states, the Ministry of Magic creates and imposes laws through its Department of Magical Law Enforcement. So that includes having police and prisons. Plus there's the Aurors, who are like the FBI or the military. They have the entire country wiretapped, as it were, to detect who's using magic anywhere at any time. It has the power to intervene at Hogwarts anytime it likes because it has a Department of Education. And that's pretty much how governments work. They take over something, claim the power to do something that was being done privately, turn it to shit, and then tell everyone things would be even worse if not for them. The Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures is how wizards extend their power over all sentient beings rather than just humans. These are the institutions for organizing violence. They are unnecessary, oppressive, and ripe for a tyrant to infiltrate and take over, which, as we see in Book 5, is merely a case of appointing one. So why aren't these the things that change when Voldemort dies. The books seem to imply those things can be bad, but are still necessary. And as I've explained in about 50 different ways on this channel, they are not. 
I see no justification in letting a bunch of bureaucrats, or whoever it is who writes legislation in the wizarding world, decide for everyone else in the UK what behaviors are allowed and not allowed, and therefore punishable by violence. And if you think it's different in our world because we have elections, well, elections are for the people who vote on legislation, not the people who make it. And those votes usually go where the money tells them to. Why is there still money in the Harry Potter world, anyway? It's presumably for the same reason it ex still exists in our world. We're forced to use it, because using money, as opposed to sharing everything, benefits the people who have money. We see in the books that people with money, like Lucius Malfoy, can bribe the government to get their policies passed. But that's the only reason I could think they would still have it. It's clearly unnecessary. Wizards have the power to eliminate scarcity even more easily than the rest of us do. It's conveniently noted in the books that magic can't produce food, but it can be used to expand the amount of land around your house and change weather conditions and so on, so why can't everyone make their own food? How long would it take to make clothes for everyone? Why can't the school provide lessons and books for free? Why do wizards accept class society? Why do they still have jobs and bosses rather than democratically organized work? Poverty and long hours are clearly a problem the wizarding world shares with our own, and none of it changes. The rich can buy favor with the ministry, and sure, the tone of the book frowns upon it, but it's another example of something inherent in the state. Legislators' minds are made by money. Rich people have always been in control of the state. They will always be able to control it as long as there are states. And yet, even by the end of the series, there's no question of redistribution of wealth or abolition of money or the state. The state preserves the institutions of money and borders and laws because that's how you preserve your power. It doesn't matter who is minister. The modern state claims all these powers. The critique in Harry Potter seems to be that they shouldn't do those things, or they shouldn't do all those things. It's a critique of the excesses of power, but not of power itself. The thing about state power is it's always the power to hurt and control people, and when it expands, which is constantly, it finds new ways to hurt and control people and make the rich richer. Apparently, nothing fundamentally changes after Voldemort dies, as all the laws and powers of enforcement and all the useless departments are still there. What happens when there's a new minister and they decide for any reason they want to use those powers? Rowling is supposedly showing her disdain for government and bureaucracy here, but they don't go away just because you don't like them, nor if you just get rid of the current despot. Putting different people in the same seats might make things temporarily better, but do nothing in the long term. We're supposed to see people like Dolores Umbridge, the uber-bureaucrat, as the enemy when really the enemy is the institution she gets her power from. Any small group of students could have taken her down, but they knew if they did, a bunch of magic cops would swarm on them. These books have all the makings of a screed for abolishing government and the monetary system, yet they never get there. Most people don't want the state to turn tyrannical, or let's say, even more oppressive than it is at the best of times. The problem is, the only solution is to eliminate it. Otherwise, it keeps getting stronger, especially during a crisis. We could salvage what's left of the ministry and organizing it, organize it without centralizing power and hoping things will just work out. What if... After killing Voldy, we proceed to abolish the Department of Magical Law Enforcement. It's not so far-fetched that people can defend themselves without it, since throughout the series, the kids fight for what's right, irrespective of rules and laws and their lack of ability. 
They prove that anyone could do it. How about there's a referendum on a constitution with a few basic laws that could stay, like don't hurt people except in self-defense and don't do magic in front of muggles. And if those pass, anyone has the authority to enforce them. There are all kinds of possibilities for organization when the state is out of the way. Here's my suggestion for how governance could work. Or another suggestion. <laughs> Everyone who wants to belongs on councils with rotating membership based roughly on region. Councils that coordinate with each other horizontally, without hierarchy. Again, their mandates could be limited to keeping people safe and keeping magic secret. So if there's a small threat to safety or secrecy, members of the local council could manage it. And if there's something bigger, they can call in members of other councils. This decentralized approach can also hold people accountable. If one council was training kids to kill muggles or something, the other councils could vote to intervene. Not a perfect system, but it would eliminate all traces of the despotism that comes with governments and ministries and bureaucracies and make it impossible for such an institution to return. But instead of emancipation, we're treated to Rowling's fantasy that nothing much changes. The boring liberal order where class hierarchy, money, jobs, laws, bureaucracy, and the police are restored that no one feels the need to roam outside the basic ideology they grew up believing. There are positives in Harry Potter, like solidarity and rebellion, but nothing that would really overturn anything. Wizards address the most pressing issue, stopping Voldemort, and then they go back to normal. If you've ever said, I can't wait to go back to normal around me during this pandemic, you might have heard me reply that normal was the problem. But what do you think? Is Harry Potter actually pretty radical? Is it even more reactionary than I make it out to be? Can you think of better fantasy and sci-fi books to read? Tell us in the comments. Thanks for watching.